Hi, morning everyone, and welcome to um, another episode of our CSEC lecture series. Um, this CSEC lecture series is a collaborative effort with the University of the West Indies History Department. And we just want to thank you all for tuning in today. Today, I would like to welcome Dr. Zachary Bayer. Um, Dr. Bayer um, will be presenting on the theme of the indigenous peoples and the Europeans. And his topic is Europeans and the First Peoples of the Caribbean, Conquest, Collapse, and Continuity. And just to introduce myself, my name is Alexis McDavid, and I'm an outreach officer at National Museum Jamaica, which is a division of the Institute of Jamaica, which is an agency of the Ministry of Culture. And to introduce Dr. Bayer, um, Dr. Bayer did his PhD at Syracuse University. And he's not just a lecturer here at UA, but he is the president of the Archaeological Society of Jamaica. And his research focuses on the archaeological and heritage of the Caribbean um, both prehistoric and at historical sites. So thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you, Dr. Bayer, for being here today. And let's get started. Thank you, Alexis. So to kick off this lecture, um, the first question is, who were the first peoples of the Caribbean? Oh, geez, big, big question. I, I guess to begin, I just want to wish, uh, thank you for the opportunity first, Alexis, and best of luck to all the the fifth form uh, students with CSEC preparation as well as achieving future professional academic goals. Uh, so our first question, who were the first peoples of the Caribbean? That's going to require us to go back about 8,000 years uh, in time, well before the advent or the arrival of, of Europeans, the Spanish, into the Caribbean. So let's just you know orient ourselves. We're dealing with a geographic entity, the Caribbean, spanning from northern South America. Uh, that area around the Orinoco River Valley in present-day Venezuela is very significant uh, to our discussion, as well as uh, stretching up to and uh, 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 through the Yucatan, so Central America, as well as up to southern North America, Florida, uh, almost providing a stepping stone from uh, uh, South America up to North North America with, with connections to Central. But migrations didn't happen as, as orderly and, and, uh, and routine as, as we might expect. Uh, Archaeology done throughout the region has revealed uh, initial population movements, initial migrations, again, beginning around as early as 8,000 years ago. Uh, and continuing uh, uh, until about 5,000 years ago. Uh, by 2,000 years ago, 2000 BC, almost every single island in the Caribbean has, has been populated beyond a few, uh, including, including Jamaica. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, these series of migrations, though, uh, have been, and I'm, I apologize, how about I go? forward in time for these students so they can see these nice slides. Uh, this migration, this complex series of migrations, was organized in initially in the mid-20th century by a, an American archaeologist, uh, Irving Rouse. Uh, while at this point in the 21st century, we, we criticize this model, but it's, it's provided some clear organization around early groups to later groups, organized around lithic age groups that coming with their certain types of stone tools into the Caribbean around 4,000 years ago, coming from regions like I mentioned, Yucatan, Central America, Honduras, Belize, uh, followed then by a, another wave coming from South America. This wave had already settled Trinidad. Trinidad's unique. It's not only very close to South, South America, but at one time would have been connected to it, right? So it's unlike the island ecology, found throughout the Caribbean, uh, uh, Trinidad stands out. From that early movement, around 8,000 years ago into Trinidad, these groups start moving throughout the region, these archaic age groups, different types of stone tools, slightly different uses of, 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 of subsistence practices, so what they're eating, shellfish, uh, uh, the advent of early forms of horticulture, agriculture. They, they leave Trinidad and start spreading throughout 
the, the Caribbean, but not following that stepping stone. They actually make huge jumps into the northern Lesser Antilles. So I'm encouraging students to view the region not, not necessarily as orderly. Oftentimes these human, you know, these maritime travelers were, were traveling across large stretches of open water for various reasons, exploration, colonization, interaction. Right, so and again, this is all migration and, and developments happening well before the advent of Europeans over here. After the Archaic Age, you have a tremendous amount of diversity during the Ceramic Age, beginning around 500 BC, so 500 years before the birth of Christ. You have movements, one of the most famous and, and well-known movements, again, coming from South America, known as the Saladoid. Uh, 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 societies and they again have a very distinctive type of ceramics some of the earliest ceramics in the Caribbean beautiful white on red different styles you may, as a museum coordinator you may have seen these before but not recovered in Jamaica that that and we'll get to that there's no early ceramic groups in Jamaica the movement into Jamaica happens later with some of these later ceramic groups that I've mentioned like the osteonoids yeah, and these are funny names, uh, uh, and these are based on archaeological assessments of ceramics and, and variation that way. But it's those osteonoids that develop into what we know as, as Taino societies, the, the, the historical group encountered by these early European Spanish, Spanish people alongside Taino during this historic age. You've got the popularly known group, uh, the Caribs, right? now in the, uh, uh, to today commonly known as island colonago groups. You've got remnants of those populations still living in places like Dominica, for instance. Uh, I, I did my dissertation research there and, and visited that, that, that region, it, and it's, it's quite unique. But those are the main groups that, again, would have encountered the Spanish at, at the time of contact. But there are likely in archaeology and, and also ethno-historical documents when the Spanish are coming into the area, they're recording their observations and the different types of people. The archaeology, ethno-history, just demonstrates a, a lot of variation in these societies that today we say are either one side, Taino, perhaps peaceful, met Columbus, interacted, were decimated by that, and then island Colonago. Carib, cannibal, warlike, right? There, there's some clear issues with those common designations, uh, and, and most clearly around the idea that you're, you're hiding a whole lot of variation that would have been operating at that time. Variation in the types of natural environments uh, Caribbean islanders would have been adapting to, uh, cultural interactions with not only other islands, but surrounding mainlands that just created one of the most diverse pictures in prehistory uh, in, in all of the world, right? I've mentioned the use of archaeology, uh, mentioned the use of ethno-historical documents, but this, the discussion that I just provided, hopefully briefly and not too complicated, is a story that you can't rely on documents alone. There's a clear lack of information or an absence of conventional documentary sources available for talking about who these pre-Columbian peoples are. The story is best told using a combination, documents, ethno-histories, as well as, as, well as archaeology. And, and the picture that we've been able to, to develop about who these people are that, that interacted, greeted, encountered, Columbus is, a, again, complex and requires us to go back a couple hundred years before Columbus arrived in 1492, 1493 in the Caribbean. Uh, this was a, the Caribbean was in a period of change. You see the development of some of those later ceramic age groups, those osteonoids I mentioned in places like Jamaica, Cuba, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, advancing, taking on greater social complexity and all, using a term that's often used by sociologists, archaeologists, chiefdoms, right? Implying that they're more than just nomadic bands or tribes. They are dense populations, numbering in the thousands, with far-reaching connections, not only, say, within an island, but across islands and 
and to mainlands, North America, Central America, South America. Uh, so you see increased social complexity, the types of societies, the number of, of people living in those societies, as well as the level of, of interaction. And all that contributed just an in, a tremendous level of, of diversity, right? At the time of contact, uh, diarists, chroniclers that were with the Spanish document at least three groups. I mentioned the island Carib, I've mentioned the Taino, the Guanajuato Bay was another group identified existing in western Cuba. They were believed to be an is isolated group in that region. They were described at this point of contact, speaking a different language, living in a, in a less advanced way as surrounding Taino populations. Perhaps what you're seeing there is a continuity of these earlier uh, 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 lithic groups that had come from Central America that we talked about in our first slide. But at this point, archaeologically, at the Guanajuato Bay haven't been identified. But seemingly, they were present at the time, at the time of contact. But all of these groups, whether you know, they've been documented historically or archaeologically, uh, would have been tremendously impacted by, at the time of, uh, uh, of the arrival of Europeans. A whole series of disasters were set in motion that many people argue led to the extinction of these peoples, including disease, disruption to traditional uh, uh, subsistence practices, economic interaction, kinship networks, where people were not only moving within an island to different sites, but across islands. Uh, along with famine, forced labor, and, and disease. Uh, our discussion today really focuses on the Greater Antilles. This was the first place encountered by early Europeans. Uh, uh, was the first place to see some of, this, some of this disruption. You don't see that in the Lesser Antilles until post-1620s, at least, OK? When and why did Europeans begin exploring the Caribbean? Good question, Alexis, and I'm sure many of your students have been introduced to this, this topic. We're going to frame it around the pursuit of God, uh, gold, and, and glory. The Caribbean stands out as one of the first lands in the Americas to be encountered, as well as conquered on a, on a large scale uh, by, by Europeans. Exploration of this new world, new for some, very old for others, as we, as we just mentioned. Uh, was commenced by Christopher Columbus in 1492 with support from Queen Isabella I, King Ferdinand II of, of Spain, and then later missions, not with, with Columbus and also not with that king and queen, were, were also supported by, by King Charles V. Uh, it's, it's regarded that some of the initial interactions, you can see this in, in some of the images of the slides, were, were peaceful, inquisitive, characterized by mutual exchange of, of objects and, and knowledge. That, that, quickly, that, that quickly changed uh, with the search for gold, the expansion of a, of a, uh, of a Catholic uh, kingdom as the primary effort of this, of this endeavor, uh, especially the search for gold. And this was you know, rare in the Caribbean, but was discovered in Hispaniola, so Haiti, Dominican Republic, and, and Puerto Rico. But it, was, but it was rare, but this was sought after by the Spanish in order to finance the Spanish crown's mounting European debt. They were borrowing money to support their infrastructure and their, their, their political base back, back in Europe, as well as these these missions of, of expansion. Uh, so the, this, this effort then required the intensification of mining, extractive uh, 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 economies in the 16th century, which was clearly to the detriment of, of native peoples, because it relied on their, on their coerced labor. Uh, so a primary effort around, and it wasn't just gold, but the primary effort of Spanish colonial enterprise was concerned with organizing and exploiting natural and human resources. Gold, sugar, we then see the role of, uh, with sugar, agriculture and livestock. Uh, this pursuit was supported by the establishment of the encomienda system, uh, which the, the Spanish has essentially adopted from their interactions in the old world with North Africans, the Moors. Uh, which was a system where Spanish conquerors were rewarded with the labor of native peoples 
uh, in exchange, and then Native peoples in exchange uh, received instruction in the Christian faith as well as Spanish language. Uh, along with the es establishment of this labor uh, hierarchy, social hierarchy, you see the establishment, and we'll see this in some of these case studies I'm going to bring up, of other forms of Spanish life in this new, in this new world, right? Uh, uh, new settlements, far different than the indigenous settlements that have been identified archaeologically and described, ethnohistory, gridded towns centered around plazas, which is a Spanish pattern. If you go to Spain, and I'm encouraging Jamaican students focus on Spanish Jamaica. Uh, Spain's a beautiful place to go to to read these archives and, and, and better understand this connection. But, and you may actually even see some instances of how settlements were organized over there that then were translated over here. So colonialism, the control of people, the extraction of resources, takes on a very material basis, making archaeology an ideal, ideal uh, application in that study, right? We deal with stuff bits and pieces. Uh, so the encomienda system, this was instituted by Columbus almost upon his, his initial arrival in, in, uh, in 1492 in Hispaniola, so Haiti, Dominican Republic. Natives were required to pay tribute under Columbus or face brutal punishment. Uh, again, demanding gold, and when it wasn't provided, uh, individuals were tortured. They were relocated, a, a variety of, of bad uh, uh, stuff was done to them. This system was then formally uh, instituted under a later governor after Columbus was ousted for his poor treatment of, of the native peoples and for, for conflicts with the, with the Spanish crown. So it was uh, established under, and we're going to talk more about this guy later, Fray Nicolas de Ovendo, who was uh, an early governor of the, the West Indies following Columbus, Columbus's removal. So. The encomienda system not only resulted in, in coerced labor, but, it, but as I mentioned just earlier, it resulted in the redistribution of people, right? Similar to the African slave trade, where people are taken from their homes, placed in new areas on the island, on the same island, or in completely different islands. I mean, there are stories of Jamaican natives removed to Hispaniola to work the mines. Uh, there are stories of as the Spanish Empire is expanding into Central America, Indian slaves taken from Honduras and moved into places like, like Jamaica. So I, I'm sure you, Alexis, and, and students listening to this can understand the level of disruption that would happen within the households, within families, within traditional practices as a result of forced labor, right? To, to maintain cheap labor so you can reap the benefits of that uh, and support your own, your own development, right? Uh, but this process also began the longer process, the development of Euro-American societies right here in the Caribbean. Uh, success of the Spanish and success, it's kind of a tough word to use in terms of uh, just the very negative treatment of, of native peoples. Uh, this success, though, based on harnessing human labor, extracting natural resources, was a model adopted by other European nations. The, the English, the French, the Dutch, the Danish, all after around post-1620, start instituting their own models, which lead to not only tremendous levels of cultural, ecological exchanges, but, as, but the instituting of what we now know as the transatlantic slave trade, okay? Uh, after the ex essentially native labor, Amerindian, Caribbean Indian labor was, was extinguished. How were indigenous societies in the Caribbean affected by Spanish colonialism? Uh, great question, but kind of two sides to that question. Uh, it's not just about what Europeans are doing, but it's also about how indigenous societies are responding uh, uh, resisting, reacting. So we're going to look at both of those sides of that question. Uh, and again, getting back to some of the earlier issues that we mentioned, the best way to approach that two sides of the question is, 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 is the combination of historical data. And again, from the Department of History and Archaeology, that's the combination of documents, ethno-histories, and, and archaeology. So I, this discussion should bring out the value of those sources. Uh, Clearly, Europeans are impacting uh, indigenous 
uh, populations. It's resulting in demographic changes, the imposition of Spanish life ways and culture in this setting and on these people, as well as economic destabilization with, with, indig uh, 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 with the destabilization of traditional indigenous practices, craft work, uh, subsistence strategies that had gone on for thousands of years. But you also see uh, the uh, outright resistance by native peoples uh, this in the uh, around I, I think it's 1520s maybe a bit later in Puerto Rico you have you have an indigenous rebellion there that is put down by the Spanish but you also have the introduction of indigenous crafts and agricultural products at sites I'll mention uh, and in the Spanish uh, uh, domain in the in their own uh, daily life uh, uh, along with not only European diseases, but also indigenous diseases. And we'll, we'll talk about evidence of indigenous disease uh, that has been identified in the archeological record, the evidence of, of, of syphilis, right? And its presence in this region, uh, uh, which, which most certainly Europeans would have, would have encountered. And it's important to, to note uh, that, an important caveat for, for students, that the diff, the, there's clear differences in Indian responses and survival based on what island you in fact were on, right? Hispaniola, uh, Puerto Rico were very mining intensive. What happens in islands that are very mining intensive versus islands like Jamaica, which no gold was historically found. It wasn't intensively used that way, but agriculture and livestock rearing became the main focus. Are there different responses by, by native societies, and, and more research is required for that, but it's an important caveat for students, I think, to, to consider. We will, though, begin our, our discussion of, of impacts of Europeans on indigenous societies with a, with a focus, and this is a sensible focus, in Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. These are the first places uh, and the central focus in the expansion of, of the Spanish during their colonizing efforts in the Greater Antilles. Uh, both historical and archaeological research demonstrates the intensification of the mining industry, the introduction of sugarcane cultivation, as well as other imported plants, as well as the reliance on both uh, uh, Indian slave trade, the trade in, in Amerindians, as, and then later African slaves. It's interesting to note by 15, between 1520 and 1530 in Puerto Rico, the, the laborers that are listed are including Indian laborers, African laborers side by side, right? With African labor, enslaved laborers outpacing Indian labor by the by the mid 16th century. So beyond the co, co the pattern of coerced labor, you're seeing this pattern of of interaction and and perhaps even integration, right? Uh, in Hispaniola, that that. West in that early West Indies governor that we mentioned earlier, Fray Nicolas de Ovendo, uh, he arrived in his in Hispaniola in 1502. Uh, he arrived with 2,500 people, far exceeding what the 300 Spanish people, along with their enslaved well enslaved Indians and other Indians that remained free throughout the island. Uh, Bartolomeu, Bartolome de las Casas, he was a member of this expedition and becomes an encomendero, so essentially a Spanish conquistador that, that is gifted with, with native laborers uh, in exchange for their instruction in Christian faith, Spanish language. Las Casas, though, has a, a spiritual awakening, though. By the mid-16th century, he wrote the book, A Brief Account of the Destruction of the Indies, uh, in 1552, documenting the abuses uh, uh, towards uh, Amerindians by, by these Spanish conquistadors and comenderos. What he describes, though, during this initial arrival uh, in Hispaniola in 1502 is that most of the Spanish newcomers quickly rushed to the gold fields in order to take advantage of, of, of extractive industries, and at least a thousand of them died from, from disease, right? So this was uh, this is far tougher for uh, native laborers, but the, the adjustments and adaptions to uh, the Caribbean was, was, was difficult, uh, you know, for, especially in terms of disease on, on both ends. 
Ovendo's goal, though, in Hispaniola was to establish a viable colony for the benefit of the crown, based on the exploitation of Indian labor and gold extraction. Uh, most importantly, though, he was instructed to move Indians uh, into villages close to these mining towns, right? So you could have a readily available source of labor. That obviously is, is going to impact these settlements, these indigenous settlements that had been occupied for at least a thousand years or more. And I'm going to provide some examples of those right now uh, when we talk about the archaeology of Hispaniola. Considerable archaeology has been done throughout Haiti and Dominican Republic uh, uh, at not only early Spanish sites, but at, in, at indigenous sites, uh, uh, including En Bas Saline. Uh, en Bas Saline uh, is, is a large classic town uh, uh, believed to be the town of a Taino cacique, a chief, who would have assisted Columbus and his crew after the wreck of the Santa Maria on December 24th, 1492. What, what, what a Christmas Eve you would have, would have had in, in, in this new world, right? Uh, that crew would have quickly established a small fort close to En Saline called La Navidad. Uh, that was found to be destroyed on Columbus's second voyage. So again, initial, perhaps peaceful interaction quickly, quickly changed uh, uh, by 1493, 1494. The destruction of La Navidad resulted in the, the settlement of La Isabella, which was located farther to the west in 1493 and 1498. And then the later development of Puerto Real, very close to En Basilene in 1503. The archaeology at En Basilene, this indigenous Amerindian site located in, in, in Haiti, uh, so on the island of Hispaniola, but the Haitian side instead of the Dominican Republic side, uh, clearly demonstrated that this wasn't immediate extinction among Taino, but this indigenous site that had been occupied for well over a thousand years was clearly impacted. And what was most impacted are the activities of indigenous men that would have been taking place at this indigenous site. And that impact was because of that Spanish encomienda system. So activities of men like stone tool production, the production of shell, stone, and bone ornaments, hunting of terrestrial animals like coney and bird, and some fishing practices halted. Uh, at least the archaeological evidence of that, of those activities weren't, weren't found. Uh, female activities seemingly were able to persist, including the, the production, the processing of manioc and cassava, uh, shellfish gathering, as well as food preparation and, and ceramic production. So those activities seemingly continued at, at En Basilene. But archaeology also demonstrated that en Baseline, European artifacts, Spanish artifacts, like Spanish mayolicas, that's a certain type of a very beautiful ceramics. And again, I encourage students to go to Sevilla and you get to see the, the mayolica tiles along these, these whether it's floors or, or table wares, right? These, these, these European wares were found, I mean, very rarely, right? Out of 80,000 artifacts recovered at En Basilene, less than 0.8% are of European origin. And it wasn't these type of materials. It was European animals, rats, uh, uh, pigs, other livestock. So seemingly, you have the continuity of indigenous societies at En Basilene while resisting certain aspects of European Spanish colonialism and incursion, right? So you still have societies not completely decimated and, 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 cho and, and choosing to a certain extent what they are bringing back home. This is a process known as compartmentalization where in the necessary spheres of life I can act Spanish, but back at home we're going to try to maintain that traditional aspect and what, what is familiar uh, to us and sensitive. Uh, to our own, our own needs, right? So beyond indigenous settlements, archaeology in Hispaniola has also included the, the study of early Spanish towns like La Isabella, like Puerto Real that I mentioned. The archaeology here has revealed fortified sites, so forts, military sites. A, uh, the settlements were organized around a grid plan, so streets, plazas, 
churches, along with Christian burials, uh, and then a whole suite of European objects like ceramic tablewares that I've mentioned, uh, personal adornments, even uh, evi crucifixes, evidence of personal adornments, as, as well as religious beliefs that are far different than the practices that would have been operating at these, at these, at these ind indigenous villages. Uh, these early European towns, Puerto Real, La Isabella, you can see a, an image of La Isabella uh, there, they were surrounded also by indigenous sites. Some of these would have been indigenous sites occupied for, for a long time. Other sites were, were indigenous people actually moved over into these, into these villages. And, and archaeology also reveals through the study of, of material culture important status differences marked in the material record. High frequency, a high concentration of, of, a, uh, of, of European material culture, higher priced ceramics. These are associated with elite residences. Right? Perhaps Columbus's citadel or house that was identified and excavated at La Isabella versus areas where you find a lot of these indigenous ceramic cultures Right, that not only may these be aligned with indigenous peoples, but also at this point in early Euro-American societies, lower status individuals likely working as, as laborers or, or uh, other uh, low-skilled artisans. So how about we bring it home, Alexis? So what was life like in Jamaica during this time? Well, uh, and again, a question best answered through documents and archaeology, and this is how I will answer it. Jamaica first entered European history in 1494 during Columbus's second voyage. voyage. It's important to note, though, Columbus was reportedly told the location of Jamaica by Indians he encountered in Cuba during his first voyage, right? So Jamaica was put on the map in Columbus's mind by, by indigenous peoples, which clearly show you indigenous people knew their landscape, not only their islands, but their surrounding islands, despite these islands seemingly being isolated or separated by open water. The distance between Cuba and Jamaica is 150 miles. Seemingly that was not a long way to go to travel. For these, for these Cuban Indians. After establishing Hispaniola as a viable colony, and we mentioned that uh, earlier, uh, uh, for the benefit of the Spanish crown, based on the exploitation of Indian labor and gold extraction, you then see the formal conquest of Jamaica beginning in 1509, along with Cuba in 1510. Uh, this was a, a, an expansion ordered by the then governor of the West Indies, Nicolas de Ovendo, we, we mentioned him before. He was removed from that position in 1509 based on his poor treatment of native peoples, similar to whether it was poor treatment of native peoples or squabbles with the Spanish crown. These governors seemingly in the West Indies didn't, didn't last long. Ovendo was actually replaced by Diego Columbus. He's the son of Columbus. So this was a family business, right? Uh, who was also later recalled. For, for defiance of royal power uh, in 1523. Diego Columbus's son, Luis Colón de Toledo, was then named the Admiral of the Indies and, and later on, 1536. And, and I mentioned that family history, that history of governorship, because Luis Colón de Toledo, he was granted the island of Jamaica, essentially given it to him as his personal, as a, as a fief or fief which is your personal property and the people that, that lived there. So he became the Marquis of, of Jamaica in 1536, the grandson of, of Columbus, right? Uh, in Jamaica, the encomienda system uh, was, was officially recognized in Jamaica in 1515. Uh, no gold was discovered in Jamaica, so Indian labor was quickly shifted for its use in art, agriculture and cattle raising. Jamaican provisions and livestock, is essentially, I mean, essentially Jamaica became the breadbasket for further Spanish expansion into South and, uh, South and Central America, which becomes known as the Spanish Main. Indians were reportedly transferred from Jamaica 
to Hispaniola to work in the gold mines, as well as Indians from Honduras being transferred into Jamaica uh, to work, whether it's on plantations, agriculture, on live, livestock purposes. Uh, there's incredible opportunity to, to document the experience of Spanish people, of indigenous people, of Africans, during the 16th century in Jamaica. More work needs to be done, and I'm encouraging these, these uh, intrepid CSEC students to take this on. There's a number of sites that speak to the Jamaican experience, indigenous sites including White Marl, which I'll, which I'll talk about here. That's a very important site for Jamaican pre-Columbian history, as well as Maima. That's located on the north uh, coast, close to Ocho Rios, close to Sevilla La Nueva. Seville, right, where the, where the IOJ uh, Museum uh, is, is located, right? You also have European sites, though. Sevilla La Nueva, uh, as I just mentioned, de, Villa de la Vega, Spanish town. Oristan, which is located on the south coast, has not been uh, located. Spanish caravels sunk on the north coast in 1503 uh, uh, during Columbus's fourth voyage, still sunk. We need to find those. Uh, and then also maroon sites, African maroon sites like Nanny Town, which when archaeology has been done at Nanny Town, you're not only finding what the evidence of African uh, presence there, you're also seeing indigenous material culture there. Perhaps it's not indigenous people first, African maroons, perhaps it's more about interaction of those, of those runaway, resistant, isolated, uh, uh, society. So lots of potential. I want to encourage your, your students to think about that. But let's just take, again, a step back to think about who's in Jamaica at the time that that's Columbus arrives. As I mentioned earlier, people arrived to, the first peoples in Jamaica arrived quite late. I mentioned that first, that initial wave, that lithic migration. They're in Cuba, uh, uh, Haiti, by around 4,000 years ago, not Jamaica. They don't arrive in, well, and not those same peoples, but later ceramic making peoples, those are the first people of Jamaica, these osteonoids, they don't arrive there until 550 years after the birth of Christ, five, uh, uh, AD 550. Jamaica, so there's no pre-ceramic occupation, it's all of these later ceramic making peoples. Uh, and, and the migration history of Jamaica during this time is characterized by two separate waves. So these weren't necessarily related. A first wave, largely referred to uh, based on their ceramics, a distinctive red ware, painted ware style of ceramics that in archaeology archeolo speak, it's known as the Osteonon Osteonoid peoples. These are sites located along the coastline of Jamaica, smaller sites, and, and not as intensively occupied as this second wave, which is referred to as the White Marl style. We'll talk about White Marl. This is that second wave that would have, that would have the, the people that developed into Taino societies and the ones that would have greeted Columbus. So Jamaican Taino come from, uh, come from this, this uh, uh, second occupation phase, OK? Uh, moving forward. Jamaicans are described not only, Jamaican Taino are described not only based on the archaeology, but also on ethno-historical documents. You've got a variety of documents available, such as uh, the ones created by Andres Bernaldez. He was on, he was a chronicler on uh, uh, Columbus's trip, second trip into Jamaica, so 1494, and he, he provides some very, and they're, they're on the slide here, so I hope the students can see those. I won't read the descriptions, but he, but he provided some very unique, specific descriptions to Jamaican peoples, revealing settlement patterns, social organization, as well as the technology of indigenous peoples at the, at the time of contact. But this information also contributed to misinformation. Eurocentrisms about peaceful Arawaks, Taino, and, 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 and warlike cannibal caribs. Archaeology in Jamaica at sites like, like White Marl is, is unique in that, well, is significant in that it underscores the experience of, of Jamaican, what became Jamaican Taino peoples from around that 
time of AD 900 all the way through through contact. White Marl is an incredibly large indigenous village, probably the largest one in Jamaica, and it's been the focus of archaeology since the mid uh, 19th century. This this archaeology has been quite sporadic, though. Uh, recent work has has been. Uh, has, has began since 2016. The UE Mona Department of History and Archaeology, Jamaican National Heritage Trust, individuals from even your, your neck of the woods, the IOJ, have been out there uh, working, revealing a complex settlement featuring dense, uh, an incredibly dense archaeological record. The ceramics I've mentioned, faunal remains, but also some very well preserved and significant human, human burials. Okay? And I'm, I'm kind of speeding up here. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, ceramic culture demonstrated at White Marl, subsistence practices of uh, involving terrestrial animals, sh shellfish, fish, birds. But, but what really stands out are some of these, these well-preserved and significant uh, burial practices. Burial practices where individuals were placed in, in fetal position, quite deep within the ground. The idea is that you're returning the individual back to the belly of the mother, mother Earth. Again, this is not uh, a monotheistic Christian type of practices. These are clearly revealing animism, polytheism, polytheism. Uh, di so different styles of burials, fetal position. We also recovered an individual seemingly in a seated type of reclined position. So these different positions are, are significant. And these burials also include religious paraphernalia, religious material culture like zemis that speak to uh, 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 the natural forces that take on an anthropomorphic or zoomorphic form, whether they're stylized similar to humans or similar to the range of animals that would have been uh, in, in Jamaica. At that time, recently, a, an owl zemi was recovered uh, from excavations at White Marl. Uh, so very significant. Diet, feasting, archaeology at White Marl also demonstrates the application of advanced uh, 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 technology in, in archaeology, including uh, uh, carbon and nitrogen uh, isotope analysis, which is all what you are is what you eat, uh, based on the type of plants, the type of fish, the terrestrial animals you're eating. That's going to leave a distinctive signature. So some of the barrels we recovered at White Marl don't match the White Marl signature, seemingly showing you just because you die at White Marl doesn't mean you were born there, right? Whether you have individuals that are moving on their own terms or during later periods of time, perhaps they're being forcibly moved to an area by, Spanish, by the Spanish for during this encomienda system. It's not just White Marl in Jamaica, though. You also have an incredible site on the north coast of Sevilla La Nueva, which maybe perhaps students are more familiar with British Seville. So it was a British plantation beginning around 1655, but before that, this was the, one of the, the earliest Spanish settlement on the island Jamaica and has a similar early date to some of these settlements that we mentioned in, in Hispaniola. La Isabella, Puerto Real, it would have been within that, within that very same network. Initially though, this was the setting where Columbus was actually marooned for over a year on his fourth voyage. Those ships are likely still sunk up there. He was marooned over a year, but then returned, not Columbus, but, but uh, Juan de Esquivel and 80 settlers returned in 1509 in order to establish a formal settlement in this, in this area. And this actually became the ca capital in Jamaica until 1534, when it was moved to Villa de la Vega, Spanish town. Uh, Ethno-histories of Sevilla La Nueva recount a high level of interaction of Spanish residents at Sevilla La Nueva with surrounding Taino settlements. Likely one of those settlements is, is Maima, which, which archaeology has been, has been completed there. Uh, a fortress was documented at the site between 1938 and 1968, a Spanish fortress, a fortified building, uh, along with a, a mill. So an early, an early example of a water-powered mill that would have been used for sugar production. So, whether you're extracting gold or, or extracting sugar, this was a part of the Spanish encomienda system. Uh, interestingly, one of the most common artifacts in all of these places was, 
what was indigenous ceramics. Indigenous ceramics being found at a European site. Why is that significant? Well, it's seemingly showing you the inter... Again, this isn't just about what Spanish people are doing to indigenous societies, but it's also about what indigenous societies are contributing to these new Euro-American uh, uh, sites, uh, Euro-American societies, and ceramic culture, food ways, clearly uh, uh, an area of contribution there. So really demonstrating some of the, the, the patterns of European and, and indigenous uh, interaction. Right here in Jamaica. So did European colonialism result in the extinction of indigenous peoples in the Caribbean? I am on the side of, I mean, it's a complicated question. Clearly, and this presentation has shown you, indigenous societies were disrupted, they were decimated, they went from millions of people in this region at the time of contact to then less than tens of thousands by the mid, by the mid uh, uh, 16th century. But it's not, it's not clear extinction. Uh, there's evidence that I'm showing you right here, evidence of historical documents, Henry Morgan's probate inventory. So when Henry Morgan died, he's mm -hmm. recorded as owning two Indians, right? Where are these Indians from? Are they Jamaican Indians? Uh, are they coming from other places? Regardless, it shows the persistence of, 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 of Indians in Jamaican society. You also have historical accounts for the persistence of Indian villages all the way up into the 17th century. So I'm, I'm whether it's the historical documents or archaeology, you see continuity, you see persistence. But most importantly, today, within the last 10 to 15 years, you've seen groups in the Caribbean identifying as Taino, which people, what, what people are, you know, in the Greater Antilles, I'm thinking, what people are now referring to as Neo-Taino. Right, uh, which is a clearly significant movement, whether there's biological biological connections, or or cultural connections, right? Social activism. I, I think this is a a very important movement that that Jamaica, when we have a, a clear sense of what was going on at the time of contact, European indigenous uh, indigenous interaction, has clearly something to contribute to. And, and I think it's an important movement in 2019 of Jamaica nominating its first uh, Taino chief. And that's, uh, uh, and that's listed on the slide right there. So I, I'm, I, I'm a firm supporter of, of a Taino renaissance throughout the, greater, throughout the greater Antilles, throughout the world. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Byer, for tuning, well, coming and participating in this lecture series. And I just want to tell everyone watching, please um, follow and subscribe us on, your, on our social media platforms, the History Department, the Institute of Jamaica, and National Museum Jamaica's um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube pages, everything. And please stay tuned for our next episode. And everyone, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye.